It's episode 12 of our Retro Dev. This time we put our CPU module back into the Tank Battalion display circuit. And we get a test screen going. Then we do the same thing on the Mister. Last time we put together a simple CPU circuit with RAM, ROM and then transferred some memory from the ROM to the RAM. This time we'll do the same but we'll put the CPU circuit back into the Tank Battalion display circuit so we'll actually see something on the screen. You may remember this block diagram from a previous episode. It shows how the Tank Battalion game, in fact how many arcade games, manage the video memory contention. That is, the way video memory is accessed by the display circuit at the same time that the CPU writes data to the same video memory. A 6502 based CPU board can do it very cleverly by using two halves of the CPU clock. So this diagram we've got here has the video buffer latch which changes every 4H, it brings in some data every 4H clock cycle and then that is latched and fed into the tile map renderer and the bullet renderer. We've seen the tile map renderer before, we haven't seen the bullet renderer yet. Um, and then it gets fed into the uh, color prom and then out to the screen. So this uh, data comes from the VRAM memory and is fed through the screen memory address counter that looks at the v VRAM locations and puts it into the video buffer. Now at the same time, that's that half, at the same time on this half we've got the 6502 CPU which is addressing these various ROMs and RAMs and writing data into the screen memory, the VRAM, um, at a time that's very similar to the time that the screen memory is accessing as well. So this episode is all about how we can access the screen memory with this uh, display circuit and the 6502 CPU writing to it at the same time. Okay, here is the schematic for the CPU with RAM ROM um, attached to the Tank Battalion display circuitry. And we're just gonna delve into this to see exactly what's going on here. If I just zoom in a little bit, Uh, over on this side here, we've got our slow clock circuit. Uh, we're not using that anymore. Uh, we're going to use the Phi Zero uh, circuit um, timing input to the CPU. Uh, so here we've got slow clock or Phi Zero. We're going to just use the Phi Zero. We're using the debounce reset switch again um, to reset the 6502. So that's going to put it into its reset sequence. Uh, we've then got the address lines and the data lines connected. So the data lines are connected to a data bus which are then directly connected to the two 114s. So these are the RAM chips we've seen before. And remember from the last episode they're four bits each. So connect two of those to get eight bits. So those data lines are connected to the CPU and the 2716 ROM chip 
uh, is also connected with that data line too. Um, and then we have the selection of which one to choose by the address lines. But the address lines are not necessarily connected totally directly. So address A0 to A11 uh, is connected to these quad two input multiplexers. So the 74 LS 157s. So what these have is they have two inputs and one output and then a selector and an enabler. And the input one is the CPU address line. So A0 down to A0 up to A11. And then input two is the counter that we saw on the block diagram uh, that is counting through the video memory. And then this not phi2 is selecting it or not between the two. And we'll see what that looks like when we look at the logic analyzer output. But effectively it's switching between giving the memory address lines to the CPU or to the, to the display circuitry. And then down here, we have our latched um, 273. So that gets the data as we saw every 4H that's either coming from uh, the CPU or it's coming from the, um, the video memory, depending on which is being chosen. So here's that same circuit, but on the breadboard. If we zoom in a little bit, we'll remember that this here is the horizontal counters. Here was the vertical counters. We've got our ROM for the character, character ROM. We've got our display circuitry up here, which is feeding the output to the monitor. Down here is the uh, 2114. So this is actually the video RAM. Over here, we've got our CPU, the 6502. Then we've got our ROM, which has got the program ROM on it. Here is our glue logic. That's effectively what it's doing is if A15 is high, we're going to choose the ROM. And if the A15 is low, we're going to choose the RAM. So like we had it before. Um, and then the only addition we've got here is we've got the 74157s, which are the uh, multiplexers, which are choosing either to look at the, um, the CPU data or address um, or the video memory address. The diagram here is showing what the VRAM counter is doing. So it's counting firstly from 000 to 0F. And what that's doing is there is a bullet. There are six bullets, in fact, in the game. And they are, let's say, sprites. Um, there is a specific circuitry that is set up to be showing those bullets and these bytes are dedicated to the addresses of those. So we're going to leave those for now. We'll look at that in a couple of episodes time. And it's a really interesting part of the circuit. But effectively, every single line that is being retrieved. After that, we're then looking at a specific area of the VRAM. And we know the VRAM goes from 800 hex up to CFF hex and so what the display counter is doing is going from 800 up to 81f that is 32 characters and that is a specific line across the screen so it's going to be a horizontal line um, to the actual display which will become vertical uh, because it's rotated but it's actually a horizontal line and so it reads those 32 bytes from the memory and it puts it into the latch 2L. And then it will do that eight times. So it will effectively read this bit and, and these eight times for each line in the character ROM. 
So there's an 8x8 character ROM, and the 8 lines are being varied by the counter V1, V2, and V4, as we saw in previous episodes. So it'll do that 8 times. Once that's completed 8 times, it then uh, reads the same 00 up to 0F, again that's the bullet, but then goes to the display area of 820 up to 83F. So another 32 bytes. And it does that eight times again. And it this carries on until it goes all the way through to CE0 up to CFF. And then it's completed the reading of all the VRAM area. And then it just goes back to 800. Now the multiplexer takes two inputs. One input is the display counter and the other input is the CPU address um, to the chips and as we see here if we zoom in a little bit it alternates between them so uh, this will be the screen area 800, 801, 802, 803 and then on the other side we'll have program, 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 program these are all the CPU uh, program steps that are alternating between reading the VRAM. So we'll have a look at how that all works now. Okay, so we've got a routine in assembly language to transfer data from the ROM into the video memory. So the ROM is located at F800 and upwards up to FFFF and the screen that from that area in the ROM into the area in the video RAM and if we don't have any um, zero page RAM available we are actually quite limited on what we can do in terms of 652 assembler to move data around we have to use what's called um, direct indexed addressing and what that means is direct because we're actually naming the actual memory location and then indexed because uh, we are indexing it uh, with this Y register so what's this doing basically we're saying load Y register with the value 0 and then in loop 1 we load the accumulator A with the value that's in F900 with the offset of Y. We've seen that before, we saw it last time. So the, in, the offset is zero to start with, so it takes the value in F900 and it stores it in 0800. We increment Y by one and then we go back. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna go down through that 256 times or FF times and then when y equals zero again, uh, that will be branch, that will be zero, so it will be equal, basically equal to zero. So it goes on to the next one. So we will have copied 256 bytes from F900 to 0800. And what this does is then goes on to um, the next bit of memory, FA00 to 0900 copies another 256 bytes and it does that one, two, three, four, five times and then jumps back right to the beginning and does it all over again. Now you would hope that we could find an easier way to do this where we don't have to do this loop five times but unfortunately there, when we're using direct indexed addressing there's no way we can set this to be um, incremented easily um, and so that's why you really do need a zero page RAM to be able to uh, be a bit more flexible with your 6502 um, so we're gonna have a look at that one now how we can basically make that a bit smaller and a bit more flexible so if we had a different circuit and we had our ROM in F800 and we had our display RAM at 0800 but we also had an additional page of RAM 
um, at 0000, zero, zero, zero right at the bottom of the memory map then we could use that as a scratch pad um, to to use some additional opcodes that 6502 has um, that are very useful to us to get a bit more efficient with our code and what we do is we can place some values in the zero page area and retrieve them and increment them and it means we don't have to keep recycling the same bits of code so let's have a look and see what that does so we start off with loop zero and we load um, the x register with five load the y register with zero we load the a register or the accumulator with f9 and we store that in the location of 0, 01 in RAM. And then we load the accumulator uh, with 0, 08 and we store that in location 3. And then we load 00, 0 into the accumulator and store that into location 0 and 2. So, what that's doing is we've got the first four locations of the 0 page 00, 0 up to 0, 03 um, with basically what we had before the area we're taking data from, which is F800, um, and where it's going to put it to, 0800. So that's in that first page of zero in zero page. And then the next part um, of the loop, it says um, load the accumulator with the value that is in 00. So that is um, going to take the, the address um, in the location of 00, zero and zero, 01 or well, we've got F800 zero, zero in those and we offset it by the value Y well Y has been set to 0 for now and then we store it in zero, the location that is set by 02 and 03 and that was 0800 zero, zero. and so we're just doing what we did before but it's a, a shorthand version and then we increment y as we did before um, and then we branch if it equals um, if it doesn't equal zero it goes back and does 256 bytes whereas once we finish that and it's done the 256 bytes and it goes to zero it carries on but this time we just increment the values that are in location 0, 01 which was f8 that goes to f9 now and in 03 it was 08 that goes to 09 now and we decrement the x register now x register was set to 5 and that's just how many loops we're going to do so how many blocks of 256 bytes we want to copy and then we see does that equal 0 that um, decrementing 0 if not go back and do another 256 bytes when we've done all um, 5 uh, 256 byte blocks then we just jump back to the beginning and do the whole thing again and then you, we never get to the break so you can see this here is just a bit more of a um, much more efficient bit of code to copy those blocks we're not copying the same um, loop over and over and over but we do need zero page uh, RAM which is that RAM area that's from 000, zero, zero up to the 256 bytes um, at the bottom of the memory map um, so really your 6502 does need that memory area free and operating to be able to give you some good efficient code we've got the board hooked up to power We've got it plugged into the CRT display. We've got the logic analyzer connected to the CPU. And then if we press the reset button, when we release, the program will go through and the screen will display the, the test image. That's our familiar test image there, Mr. RetroWolf Namco. Now interestingly, um, what you'll see is sometimes when you press the reset button and we release, we don't get the full image displaying. As you can see, we get it interrupted 
Now that is to do with noise on the data lines. And so the CPU program uh, is being messed up and it doesn't complete. Um, so we'll have a look at why that's happening uh, with our logic analyzer. But effectively, um, this is spelling the end of us being able to use the breadboard uh, as we have been up till now. Um, we can essentially just about get uh, the CPU to, to write from the ROM in straight into the, um, the VRAM. But if we hook up a zero page uh, RAM or in fact any other RAM and ROM, uh, this setup as it is currently just isn't working. There's too much noise, um, probably on the uh, power distribution lines, the rails. Um, so I'm really probably going to ditch the breadboard from this point on. Um, I think the important thing to, to note is that the, the intent originally uh, for the breadboard was to build up the small parts of the circuit um, to test and then um, you know build those in Verilog as well to make sure that they were working the same and I've really achieved that in terms of making sure that the Verilog is simulating uh, what what it should be in hardware um, so now I'm hitting you know bigger points with the hardware needing to not just the digital electronics um, in its perfect state if you will um, and it's really not serving its purpose anymore. I think if I was going to make sure of getting a breadboard version of this working, uh, we could use some uh, newer chips, uh, maybe go from uh, the TTL versions of the Logic chips to the CMOS versions. Um, I could use uh, one RAM chip and run one ROM chip uh, to do everything uh, in this design. Um, much as Ben Eater does in his 6502 breadboard circuits. So we've really reached the end of what we can do with the breadboard at the moment. Um, so from here on in, I think I'm just going to be using um, the Verilog um, and it'll all be explained, you know, as we go through. And it'll, it'll also get us there quicker in terms of getting our core uh, up and running. Um, probably just a few episodes to go. Uh, before we can um, get through to something actually uh, actually working at this point. So here's the output from the logic analyzer and the logic analyzer was connected to the CPU um, for the data bus and the address bus and the clock and we also had the reset uh, was connected to. So as you can see up here we've got the address bus and it goes FFFC, FFFD, we know that well as our reset vector and it's collecting the data from those two locations and we know it collects 00, 0 and F8 and then it takes that to be our start address. We've seen the assembly language routine of the screen copy from ROM to RAM. But what I wanted to highlight here is that the is that the sample rate is 10 megahertz. So we are um, 10 above the 1 megahertz CPU clock. And what you can see here is we haven't got on the address line we've got quite good output here. Uh, no noise that we can see. Um, but on the data lines, you can see there's a fair bit of noise. So our F8 really isn't coming in until really late here. Interestingly, it's still valid and it's still going where it should, but we're getting a lot of noise. Um, and we're probably just on the edge of what's acceptable in terms of uh, data going in um, being available on the bus and then being read by the CPU and being valid. And this is where it's all starting to break down. So I think this is to do with the fact that the um, power distribution in the breadboard uh, isn't good enough. Um, I have added decoupling capacitors to the design. Uh, it's not shown specifically in the 
schematic that I've uh, included on the GitHub, but I have added lots of decoupling capacitors. I've also experimented with lots of different kinds of decoupling capacitors, ceramic, tantalum, um, electrolytic, uh, all of them, but we're not getting what we want. And what I've seen is typically people will, will redo their breadboard design um, with maybe more of a central power distribution network uh, with everything coming off of that. And I could do that, but I don't want to spend the time at this point messing around with that. Uh, we've achieved what we need to achieve. So we're going to focus on the Verilog part, but I wanted to show the fact that uh, we're getting what we want here, but it's messy. So next, what I wanted to show was the I've hooked up the logic analyzer to we've got it connected to the address bus of the CPU as I had before. So we've got our FFFC, FFFD, F800. So we can see that as the familiar addresses. But now I have the other bus connected up, which is the output of the multiplexer. And what we're seeing here is this uh, switching back and forth between um, CPU uh, work and display counting. So here you'll see 8D2, 8D3, 8D4, 8D5. This is counting through the display um, area and it's effectively looking into the VRAM. And on the other part of the clock, so this is the CPU clock, on the other part of the CPU clock we're actually just doing the CPU programming. So FFFC, FFFD now, we don't have the top bit connected, so it actually drops that. Um, but in terms of when it's connected to the chip, we it's connected directly. So it doesn't see it in this circuitry, but it is, it is there. So you can see how um, the contention works with the VRAM in a very clever way on a 6502 chip, because we're able to do both the VRAM um, access on this part and then the CPU access with the memory on this part. Um, so it's a really clever way of doing it and uh, that's been used in lots of 6502 circuits. Now when we come to do the Verilog version we're actually going to do that separately and we're just going to have a dual port RAM so they're both going to access it from different directions which just makes it much simpler. We saw in the previous uh, module where we looked at the uh, Arlet 6502 Verilog core that effectively you can't do this same thing uh, with the different parts of the clock. Uh, it's, it's not happy with that. So we're going to stick away from that and we're going to keep with the dual port RAM uh, because that works just fine for our purposes. Again, this is quite a slow sample rate because I wanted to filter out the noise because I wanted to show off the actual uh, what we're doing in terms of different parts of the clock and different parts of the function between CPU and VRAM. But if we look at a higher frequency, we can see it's not quite as clean. It's looking okay, but we do have, um, you know, on the, on the address bus, we've got some points here. And as we go through uh, a few little blips here, but generally the address buses are okay. It's mainly the data bus into the CPU, which is giving us our grief, uh, meaning that we can't really proceed much with our breadboard design. We're on the GitHub for Tank Battalion. We're on episode 12. We've got two sections we've got tank b fpga crt and vga so as we discussed on a previous video um, every time now we do something for the mister we're going to output two versions um, a raw if you will crt version that is directly emulating the arcade and then there's a scan doubled fpga vga version um, which isn't the greatest output, but it does allow people without CRT monitors to uh, see what's happening, a proper working output there with the VGA version. So if we go into the CRT, 
what we've got in terms of files. So we've merged the test circuit we had with the CPU and our FPGA tank battalion game. So we've got our usual tank battalion FPGA V. Uh, we've got our TTL chips, you'll remember. Um, we've got our um, ROM, uh, but we're adding some RAM. Uh, we're adding the CPU.V, we're adding the Arlet 6502.V that we saw before, and we're adding the ALU.V as well. So let's have a look at some of these and see uh, what's special about them. So first if we go to the ROM, we did have some ROMs before. We had the character ROM, if you remember, we had the PROM, which was the color PROM. So this, that's, these are these two, that's the character prom, that's the color prom. Now we've got uh, an MRW, Mr. Retro Wolf. This is my new program uh, ROM. And I'm just reading my program here, screen ROM RAM write.txt. We can have a quick look at that in a minute. But it's the same, same module, uh, same code, nothing, nothing special. If we go into the RAM, uh, here we've got uh, our dual port RAM. And so this is what we're using for our uh, video RAM. And we discussed it in a previous module, basically what it does. Um, but we are actually going to use this and we will instantiate it um, in the top module. Uh, and we'll see exactly what we're doing here. Now, if we look at the tank battalion uh, FPGA.V. So we've got our tank FPGA module here. And the first thing to mention is I've removed the two buttons from the IO here. Uh, we had a reset button uh, that was resetting the core. And the reason for that is I have implemented a power on reset uh, bit of code here. So the 6502 module needs a controlled way of starting up um, to trigger the, the reset vector and everything. Um, what I was doing was starting up the core and pressing the reset button. But a much better way of doing it is to create this bit of code that at the beginning of, of um, triggering the core, uh, we create a reset sequence. And so what we have is this reset count um, register and this counts up and it inputs into this uh, active low reset and it's being triggered by the positive edge of our clock which is the 18 megahertz clock in our case. Um, so what I've done is I've just quickly put this together into um, the EDA playground environment, web-based environment uh, and we can just take a quick look at what that's doing. So graphically we've got the same thing here, we've got our clock uh, that's alternating, we've got our reset that's active low and we've got this reset counter and so basically what's happening is the the reset is low the counters counting up and then when it gets up to 3f uh, the code basically makes the reset go high and then after the reset goes high the counter doesn't count anymore so it's perfect for our um, beginning reset state uh, so that code is really really elegant I um, didn't come up with this myself I just found it on the internet but it works uh, very very well Okay, after that, um, obviously I do like to put uh, wires up here, wires and registers. Um, I am looking at, uh, I split out new wires and registers just to make sure anything we've added, we know we've added. Uh, in this case, I've just added Phi2, which is used for some of the timing uh, that we're going to see in our module um, for the uh, accessing memory. Um, and it comes from Phi, Phi or Phi0 in the case of the CPU, 6502 CPU. Um, and that is the clock input. Um, so simple pass through really, we could just call it phi, but I'm just being consistent with the uh, schematic. Um, if we go down, we can see um, the most interesting thing really is how we're implementing the 157s. So the 157s were the uh, multiplexers, the quad two input multiplexers. And the main thing to mention here is that in the uh, schematics, the the wire C43, which is an input C43 here, 
is the um, basically the enabler for these chips. Um, it was uh, Phi 2 and 1. Uh, but what we're doing is we're just going to say that is equal to 1 and H256. So basically, um, whenever H blank was H256, if you remember, the H blank signal. Um, so that's effectively active um, when we're not on an H blank. And the H blank, um, the counter that we saw previously with the bullet data is happening during the H blank. So that's the important thing. Um, as well as that, the selector is always selected, um, which isn't the case in the actual uh, schematic necessarily. So that's a bit different there. And in terms of our inputs, well, this I0 is the input from the CPU. Well, we've just left it blank because we're not going to use that as we saw. Uh, all we're using this for is effectively just a dummy counter um, for the uh, the display counter, which is this here. Um, now, interestingly, what we have changed is from the last one, this pull-up resistor is equaling one. So if we go one here, zero here, and then the V128, V64, 32, 16, 8, 128, etc., that's creating the 800. So that pull-up resistor or one, one bit there in the fourth place creates the 800 upwards. So 800 to CFF is created by this input on I1. I0 is just zeros, so we're not inputting the CPU address uh, on this one, but on the actual hardware, that is the CPU address input. Other than that, we've got our clock enable um, for the CPU that we saw previously. Uh, we've got our CPU code, it's exactly the same, uh, no changes there at all. And then we're instantiating our ROM for the program, so nothing special there. And then we've got our RAM 2114, uh, this is our dual port RAM. Um, so as we saw in our RAM module, um, it's basically got two, two inputs and outputs. Uh, all the A inputs and outputs are to do with the CPU, and everything B is to do with the display um, so the um, the video RAM. Um, so what we've got here is data in uh, is the CPU data out. So it goes from the CPU into the RAM, um, and it will be at the at the address of a uh, ten down to zero. So that um, address bus is the CPU address bus, and then the write enable is our write enable from. The CPU, which you remember is uh, active low for write or high for read, um, and then we're triggered by the clock, um, which is a high clock, which is effectively making us kind of asynchronous, but it's a synchronous module as we discussed previously. Um, and then the output is RAM data output that goes into the CPU uh, down here. If we look at the B input, that's anything to do with uh, the video display. So the data B, that's the input. There is no input into the RAM uh, for the video display. All we're ever doing is fetching data from the RAM and displaying it. So there's no input B. Um, there is an address B and it's our uh, VA, uh, which we're using as video address. And that's that counter. So that's continually counting through the video memory. Um, there the write enable now this is really important as I, I was spending quite a lot of time working out a bug uh, i couldn't get anything to display on the screen and the reason was i'd left this blank and because i'd left it blank it was defaulting to a zero value and zero as we said before is active writing and so we were writing nothing basically to um to the ram uh, and overwriting everything the cpu was doing so we were actually getting nothing on the screen because we were writing nothing there. So make sure that is one, and therefore it's we're not writing through through port B, uh, which we never want to. We only ever want to read and only write through the CPU. Um, so that's that. And then our output B is going straight to that L2 chip, 
uh, which is the input to the character ROM. Um, so choosing which character ROM to show. And then we've got our bit of addressing or glue logic here saying uh, pretty simple. It's as our schematic um, ROM is true. We're reading ROM chip select is if A15 is one and then RAM chip select in this case is if we are 0001 between bit 15 and 11 that equals 800 hex. So we're just saying if it's falling in that part of the, the screen memory then it's RAM chip select. And then we're saying the CPU data in um, is based on which one of these is actually active. Is it the RAM or is it the ROM? So exactly as we saw before in the previous uh, test circuit, we've just implemented it here in the Tank Battalion game. So if you go ahead and you download the code from the GitHub and you compile that in Quarters 2, uh, once you run it, you will get a nice output screen, um, exactly the same as our breadboard uh, in the from the Mister. So what have we done? We've created a tile-based display system uh, that's being triggered with a character ROM. Um, and now we've added a CPU which can effectively write into a video display to show any characters we want from that uh, character ROM. So we've been showing static pictures, but actually there's no reason why we can't have a program that's modifying that in real time and actually do some amount of uh, manipulation there to show it's more of a computer working. So we're very close um, to having a full system. All we need next is we need um, a bit more RAM. So we need, you know, a scratch pad, if you will, to be able to do some calculations. Um, we also need some controls to be able to have some input because not much of a game if we can't change it. Um, so that's what's coming up uh, soon. What we have to do first in the next episode is uh, we need to look at the address decoding for the rest of the RAM and ROM chips um, and also um, in terms of the inputs and outputs. So we've got inputs which are controls, we've got outputs which is sound and also some other little things um, like the watchdog timer which we need to explain. Um, but so that's it's quite elegant the way the, the tank battalion game uh, was done. Uh, just a few chips and it gets to be some really good uh, addressing there. So we'll have a look, a detailed deep dive into that one in the next one um, and show you how that all works. So see you next time.